ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our May lecture for the Walsh Global History Group. Tonight we have James and Stephen Robertson from London give us a lecture on John Derman Turner. He was the painter of the Walsh <coughs> Scroll and other works. Um, they have been researching on the father. James? Yeah. James? James. I'm James. James. Has been researching. I'm the old one. <laughs> for, for well about 30 years. So it's now come to a bit more fruition to come here tonight to talk about James Tom Turner. Right. After this meeting tonight, or later on, after the Mrs. Robinson have said that bit. We have um, Esther Freud, who wants to talk a little about Sea House for 10 minutes, the book that she wrote based on Wormswick, where we all feature in it with the names change. <coughs> <coughs> um, and after that, there's some coffee and biscuits if you wish to stay. If you need to hurry away, well, there you are. The coffee and biscuits will be served afterwards. Thank you very much. Right, we've had the lights on, and where we go? Yeah, okay, so hopefully you can hear me. Yes. So I'm Stephen Robertson, and this is my father, James Robertson. It's a real pleasure for us to be invited here today and tonight, and because this is a place that was so dearly loved by John Doman Turner, um, and it's a real, so it's a real honour to actually be in this space. Um, and this is the very first time we've ever done a presentation about, or one together, we've, I've never done a presentation with my dad before, um, and uh, the first time we've actually spoken publicly um, about the research that we've been doing. So obviously, like um, Philip just said, my dad's been doing the research from years before, uh, 30 years ago, and then I picked it up a couple of years later. So I'm just going to give you a quick outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to go through and tell you about the artist himself, So, um, because I'm not sure how many people are familiar with John Doman Turner. <coughs> Actually, out of curiosity, how many people have heard of John Doman Turner? Put your hand up. <laughs> wow. Actually, quite a few. <coughs> and how many people have seen the Wolverswick Scroll? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> we want more of that. <laughs> um, and like I said, this is the first time we've done this talk, so we, get, we do have some notes that we're going to refer to throughout, because we just want to make sure we give you the right information that we've got. Um, and what we'll do is, first of all, we'll introduce John Doman Turner and tell you who he is, um, and we'll tell you a bit about his life. Then we'll talk about the research that we did, so when my father started getting into, uh, when he first heard of him, and then we'll talk about when I got joined into the project. Um, and then we'll share, for the very first time, some of the findings that we've found through our research. Um, and also, we've got a small treat at the end um, of early Walberswick works that John Doman Turner has done, but I don't think any of you have seen it, so um, we've got that towards the end. So, who was John Doman Turner? John Doman Turner was born on the 25th of October, 1871. He was born in Brixton, in London. He was the second son of um, Edmund Turner and his wife, Sarah Ann Staff, and they were from Norwich. Um, and he was baptised in St Luke's in Peckham. Now what's interesting actually, and from the research, previously it was believed that Turner was born in um, 1873, and we've now got the birth certificate to prove that this is the day that he was born. This is the family tree, um, and Ed, uh, John Doman Turner's here. Actually I've got like, a little light I can shine. So this is John Doman Turner, and we know that his, his father Edmund Turner was a carpenter and a builder. His mother was a dressmaker and a housewife, and his um, brother, Edmund Turner, um, was, he was 11 years old when John Doman Turner was born. And what we found from the family tree is that um, Edmund had five children. None of these people, none of these children, want to have their own children. So what that means is there's no direct um, descendants that are alive today of John Doman Turner's that we've we can find. We have found some living relations um, that are connected to his, um, his mother's side of the family, but they're very, very distant, and actually they're so distant that we're not sure they would even remember who that person was. 
So this is where he was born. This is Four Harbour Road in Cold Harbour Lane in Brixton. And um, this is three minutes walk away from where my dad lived when he grew up. So my father lived in uh, Herne Hill Road and three minutes walk away, he lived very close to um, John Doman Turner. And we only found that out recently, didn't we? How close that was. Through his life, we were trying to find out who he, like what his education background was. Um, and we can't find any educational records, but we have, based on proximity, we can kind of guess which type, which schools that he may have attended. Now, one of them was called Jessup's Rhodes Primary School, which is very close to where he lived. Um, and we found that his sister-in-law and his nephews went to school there, so there could be a chance that he went to that school. And funnily enough, that's where my uh, father went, went to school as well. <laughs> and so through his career, we found, through census information, we found that he is um, a stockbroker's clerk. Um, and we managed to track down from his will, he worked for this company here and they were stockbrokers and they worked in the city of London and this building here was just behind the Bank of England. So he used to work in the city and we know that it's written down in his will that he was a retired stockbroker's clerk. So actually that goes to suggest that he was a stockbroker's clerk all of his life and actually art wasn't his sort of main thing that he had to do, he had a full time job as well. So, um, so that was quite interesting to find out in the facts um, and through some of our research of what we found. So we also know um, that he married Frances um, Elizabeth um, Birch, and she was from, um, no uh, I think it was Norwich, yes, she was from Norwich, and they, um, they, they got married around 20 years old, I think they both were, and she was a picture painter, it's written down in the census, but so far in our investigation we've not been able to find any pictures that Frances had painted, but we see here, this is Frances' signature, um, that's taken from um, a photo that I took at the Swan Hotel um, and she wrote her name on what the, the uh, Trinity Fair scroll um, and we'll talk about that later. Another thing that we know about him is that he was deaf but we didn't know um, when until we found we looked at the census of 1911 and um, just here he declares that he was totally deaf since 1907. So actually, he wasn't born deaf. Um, so that was quite a finding for us, because we heard he was deaf, but we, didn't, you know, we don't know what the cause of that was. Um, and we were just talking earlier with John English, and then we were talking maybe it was measles, or it could be something like that. Um, but obviously, you know, it was quite an interesting fact. And one thing that I wonder is, is what is deafness? Did that, was that the cause of him going into the art world? Me and my dad uh, uh, disagree. Um, but it's interesting because that's kind of what I thought might have got him into the art world. It might have been that he was going deaf and he, wanted, he needed to do something else. At the age of 38, he um, was introduced to Frank Rutter, who was an art critic. Rutter introduced John Doman Turner to Spencer Gore. Now this was a really important moment in the time of in, in Turner's history because this was the moment where he kind of, um, you know, learned how to paint. Um, and this is the moment where um, they exchanged. So John Doman Turner spoke to, was introduced to Spencer Gore, and Spencer Gore, they made an agreement together. Gore said to Turner that if you care to send me drawings, I will return them with criticism, um, and I shall charge five shillings for each criticism. So what Turner used to do, he used to draw and sketch loads of work, package it up, send it to Gore, Gore would then write critiques on it, um, because he was deaf, you know, this was a great way of critiquing the work that he did, um, and he would tell him what, how to improve his works. Um, and we'll go into the letters later, because they're absolutely fascinating. Um, and Esther Freud's book, I think part of her research was having a look at the letters themselves. Um, and this is actually a, um, an image from one of the letters that are, that are out there now. I believe they're owned by the Gore estate, um, but there's copies of them in the Tate um, where you can read, get access to them. But we want them to go public um, because they're full of information, they're full of teachings from Gore, um, and they're also full of evidence for us in our research for John Doe Materna. So, that's the letters, but I'll talk to you more about that later. Um, we know that um, Gore then introduced Turner and got him to um, exhibit at the Camden Town Group. So the Camden Town Group were 16 prolific artists that held just three exhibitions um, in 1911 to 1912. Um, 
they aim to reflect the realities of modern urban life um, of the time. And uh, this, was, this was proved to be a distinctive period in the history of British art and um, before the First World War, post-Impressionism. What's really interesting is that the first exhibition, um, we see these are the four works that John Doman Turner presented at that exhibition. And the top one here is called Duncan and Godfrey in the Costa's Courtship Pastel. So, we've never seen that work, but um, I was curious, we were curious with every piece of work we come across with Turner's, um, and I wanted to find out more information. So I managed to track down in my research um, a recording of the Costa's Courtship, which was a performance that was that took place at the Brixton um, Emperor, the Empress in Brixton, um, and this is a clip of that very recording. So this was recorded at the time that Turner painted the work that was exhibited in the Camden Town Group, and you may have heard it when you were walking in tonight. That was playing in the background. So I'll just let you hear. This is the place where the and on oh, she ain't here yet, I know she will be. Cause she said she would, and Liza ain't the sort to go to tell the bloke a lie. Today I'm going to chance me love, and ask her if she'll sit and sleep for life. Though she's coming here, she's not the slightest notion. I'm going to ask her if she'll bring me little trouble and me. <laughs> so it's amazing because it actually starts to make you, uh, his work come to life hearing that. Um, and for me, it makes me think about the time that that was painted, so I think it was around 1911. Um, and it, it's a really uh, magical finding actually, it was on an old record player that we managed to get converted into MP3. Um, so, but we'd love to see the work of it, you know. Anyways, moving on. So that was exhibition one. This was exhibition two. And this is the very first time that we see Warburswick mentioned in Turner's history, actually, from our research. And, and this was years before when he was here in the 1930s and did the Warburswick scroll. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was the first time that Warburswick was mentioned that we've seen so far in our research. Um, and then... Um, in exhibition three, after this exhibition, he left. He actually, I think he joined the London group and then resigned straight away. Um, and what was it? There was, there was, it's believed that many have thought that he was shy and unsure of his abilities actually. And you do see that when you read the letters, he's very conscious, very self-conscious about the work that he does. Um, and that may have been one of the reasons, along with his deafness, that he may have left. So we also know, after the Camden Town Group, though, that he, um, he exhibited with the London Salon of um, Allied Artists Association, he exhibited at the New English Art Club, and he also exhibited at the International Society of Sculptures, Painters and Gravers. Um, and uh, the last review that we found in our research is of 1924. So, these ones happened around sort of 1916 to 1918, and then this one, there's a review of um, one of his Camden Town works at this exhibition by the Streatham Art Society um, from 1924. So he was putting work in exhibitions still, even after the, um, you know, after he came out the Camden Town Group. John Doman Turner died. He died in 1938, and he was 66 years old. Um, he died in Downton Avenue in Streatham. Um, and we found in our research, we didn't know where this was, but we managed to track it down. And he was buried with his mother, his brother, and his sister-in-law. And actually, I've been to this graveyard to try and find the grave, this tombstone. And uh, you can't see it because there's just so much moss in the way. Um, which is a real shame. I was hoping, I don't know what I was hoping for, actually. Um, but I was kind of, I guess I kind of wanted to see if there's more clues that we could find from his life. Was he buried with other families that were connected to him? You okay? Do you want some water? <laughs> um, so yes, so um, that, um, he was buried at Nunhead Cemetery and actually um, this is where my great grandfather was buried also. So after his death, years later, he was then becoming known as the Forgotten Camden Towner. Wendy Barron in 1979, she um, published a book, quite an amazing retrospective of the Camden Town Group um, and wrote, quoted here, that only two drawings by Turner are known. Um, and this was one of them. So this was Monty Willis. 
and this was, I think this was taken when he, when, when Turner went to France, um, and we're trying to find out a lot more information about that actually, because we know that he went to St. Valerie Sasson, but we can't seem to find any sort of shipping records or travelling records um, of that journey. Um, but there's some stuff that we found out from our research around this, but it's, it's really interesting. So this was one of the first pictures um, that were kind of found after he died, um, and that was exhibited, I believe. Um, but Wendy Barron then goes on to say, Domin Turner would be forgotten had he not been a member. And this kind of breaks my heart a bit, because um, what we found out now is so much about his life. Um, you know, this feels slightly unfair, but I guess it's a representation of that time. That was 1979. Um, and in 1988, this is when um, my dad got involved in, in John Doug Turner. So, Dad, do you want to talk, yeah. talk about it? Hang on. So, do you want this? Do you want yeah. this one? Okay. I'm going to call out the numbers one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks for coming, everyone, by the way. Right, previous to, to this exhibition I went to see, um, I was going around a boot fair one day and uh, I found a, a lovely oil painting. Actually, there were two. And uh, I asked the chap how much he wanted for the oil painting. And I know it's a signature at the bottom corner. Now, I didn't know the, uh, the, the artist, but it turns out it was William Ratcliffe, who was a Camden Town Group artist. And uh, it was, I've always, I've, I've been buying art for, uh, I mean, the first thing I ever bought was, uh, or had given to me was, when I was about 10 years old, I had a, a sword given to me, an old sword from 1871, a French bayonet, you know. And I think uh, that started me off on the curiosity of history and antiques and this sort of thing. Anyway, um, I, I bought the painting from the chat for 30 pounds. I wanted to find out more about William Ratcliffe and the Camden Town Group. So I went to my library and I got the, uh, the book from the library by Wendy Barron of the Camden Town Artists. And I noticed in the book, all that was on show was a, a picture, a, a drawing of Montpellier's in France, which we've seen. And there's only two, there was only two paintings known, known by him, as far as Wendy Barron was concerned. She obviously never heard of um, the Walberswick Skull. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, think, I think these people are in a, in, 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 in a, in a job. She was head of art. You know, so she was in a job where she could go to any museum, any time, and get all this information. But obviously, there wasn't nothing on Dame Turner, so she, she didn't, you know, she, she couldn't put anything together, really. So, um, after reading the book, knowing there was only two uh, drawings by Dame Turner, so I went along to this exhibition on a January, on a January day, and um, and I was overwhelmed by the uh, painting. Uh, they take after the Impressionists. I mean, Walter Sickert was a friend of Degas. He lived in France with him, you know. And uh, you've got Pissarro there, who was the son of Camille Pissarro, the Impressionist artist. So they're very, they've got a lot in common with these artists, you know. Uh, and, and these were known as the, um, the sort of British Impressionists. And they're also known as the foundation stone of British art. And I thought to myself, well, it's a great opportunity to try and collect this group because they're such a fascinating group and the paintings resonated with me because a lot of the paintings were of costermongers in Camden Town around 1911, 1912. Well, my grandmother's family were all costermongers from Camden Town around 1911, 1912. So obviously, there was something in my blood, something that attracted me <coughs> to the paintings. There, there were sales of horses and this sort of thing, you know, sales of costermongers of selling their wares on, on stalls and this sort of thing. This was exactly what my parents, uh, my grandparents were doing. I mean, the last time my mother ever came across one of my gra granny's brothers was um, in Argyle Street by the Palladium selling uh, fruit. But that was just after the war and she never seen any more of them. But it was all part and parcel of my blood if you know what I mean. It's something that I must have absorbed, but, you know. Uh, so, so obviously I've become very, very interested in, in, in this group. When I went to that exhibition, which we see the catalogue of just now, um, I wrote John D Diamond Turner's name on, on, on my hand, 
on the back of my hand, I didn't have a piece of paper. I had a catalogue. That was the catalogue, but I didn't have a piece of paper. I didn't want to spoil the catalogue. So I wrote it on and my wife said, oh, what's that? So I said, well, it's your girlfriend's telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was just to remind me of the name, John Doman Turner. Um, I wanted to find more of his work because if nobody knows what it looks like, I've got a good, better chance, haven't I? So, three months later, I'm at Lowestoft. My parents live there, and my uncle is a caretaker in a block of flats that they live in. And we all go for a family drink. I think Dawn was a little girl at the time, and Stephen coming up as well and had a lemonade, and some crisps. And uh, when we come out, my uncle, Bill, now Bill, Bill had been brought up by my grandparents, the costermongers. He'd been brought up by my grandparents. And uh, he, he, was, he was ill. So I said, well, how come you're, you're not very well? He says, well, the flats have been taken over by an housing association and I haven't been paid. Well, he can drink, but he can't eat, <laughs> which is often the case for these people. <laughs> anyway, I'll, next, day, next day I went into Lowestoft, the Tesco's in Lowestoft, bought a, a box of food. This is three months after I decided to look for John Damon Turner's work. And uh, I'm walking back and the box is getting heavier as every step I'm taking. And, uh, and there's a Morgan's. I don't know whether anyone knows Morgan's Antique Shop, do they? Do they remember? You know stuff? And um, uh, I'll, put the, I'll put the box down on the, uh, on the table there. I'll say to him, have you got any paintings or drawings about? He said, well next to your box is a plastic bag. He said, I've got a few in a plastic bag there. So I pulled a few open. And as I looked onto the corner, I see the name John Diamond Turner. And there was 13 of them. 13 of them. Now I'm looking after my grandfather's child. He, he, he was adopted by them in the 30s when the real mother, my granny's sister, died of TB. She died at birth with TB. She looked after, she brought up Bill. Yeah, and it somehow seemed to me <laughs> something was going on. I won't get too far in a point, but it turns out that it turns out later that my grandfather is born in, you know, who I thought was indicating, he's buried in Nunhead Cemetery and so is John Dunn Turner. Now you can make out of that what you will. I, I uh, decided to do a bit more investigating on John Dun uh, John Dunn Turner's work. And I went to Downton Avenue. Have you got some trees? Yeah. There's the trees. These are the famous trees of John Damon Turner uh, drew. So I said to the chap, he was, a, he was an Asian chap, he says, um, oh, he says, I said, do you recognise these trees? I said, I, I said, I get a feeling it's been done from the bedroom upstairs. So he says to me, yes, he says, um, no, my trees, he says, he says, they're my trees. So anyway, we went outside and they've hardly grown. I mean, 70 years, They've hardly grown from what they are there. So it just shows you how rotten the soil is in London. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever you do, I says, don't touch them trees. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they've got historic value, you know. <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, in, in, in the house itself, in, in the, uh, the ceiling, in the living room, looked the type of ceiling you get in Hampton Court, you know, with the lovely um, <coughs> plaster work. It, it was a magnificent ceiling. And I just had a feeling that John Damon Turner, who was very interested in uh, different parts of buildings as well, as well as uh, the, the actual main structures, I had a feeling that um, he'd, he'd done that, or his father had done that, it was a builder, you know. Might be wrong. Well, I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to get a book together, and I... I, don't know, I, I had a family growing up with four children, and I was the only one working, obviously, you've got the mortgage. I'm in the building trade, so I'm in and out like a fiddler's old bloke, see? Right, so... <laughs> right, it's, you know, it, it's just the way life is, isn't it? So you, have, you can't you pursue everything you want to pursue, can you? So um, I dropped it. But before I dropped it, <coughs> I thought to myself, I'll write to all the museums in the country that I can find. Uh, I'd already gone through all the Turners in South London trying to find out if there was any living relations. Because in them days before um, the internet, you had to do everything in the library. So I went through all the, 
Port of South London uh, 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 telephone directories. Wrote all the names down, wrote letters to every turner. We've been about 10 miles, 20 miles, and uh, never got a reply. <laughs> we off put in, you know. But then again, we all get, uh, we all fall down, don't we? Now and then we pick ourselves back up. So anyway, I, I then wrote to, uh, I wrote to, I think I wrote to 20 museums in the country. I mean, don't forget, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know anything about art really. It's good, good. I never went to university, just I love art. I got a phone call from a, a chap, Piano Noble, a fine art in Richmond. And uh, Robert Travers, Dr. Robert Travers. And he said, uh, oh, I'd be interested in having an exhibition of your paintings. And uh, we had a little exhibition down in uh, Richmond at the same time as Spencer Gore's work was being shown at Richmond Museum, which is very nice. <coughs> and uh, I met Frederick Gore down there again. Uh, we had a chat and that. Um, previous to that, uh, I got in touch with Frederick Gore and said, oh, oh Mr. Gore, I says, um, uh, I've, got a lot, I've, got, I've found some paintings uh, by a, an artist that your father taught. Oh, he says, uh, I've got an exhibition in Mayfair, so would you like to come down and uh, bring your pictures down? I'd love to see them, he says. So I went down there and um, there's people like Spike Milligan down there, he's one of the friends of, uh, because Frederick was um, a trustee of the Royal Academy on with Prince Charles. So I was <laughs> up there with the big boys. <laughs> so the 30 pence was getting me somewhere, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, we had a, he said, he said to me at the time, he said to me at the time, um, I've got letters, uh, which John Diamond Turner, John Diamond Turner sent back to my mother when my father died in 1914. And he said, if I, if, if I can fish them out, he said, if I can find them, I'll contact you. He says, be nice to get the, be nice to get the letters and the drawings together. Anyway, um, he passed away, didn't he? Uh, and I never did get to see the letters. Anyway, in the meantime, while the exhibition of... Um, while well, the exhibition is going on uh, at Richmond, Michael Parkin, who's a very, very well-known uh, dealer in modern art, he got in touch with me, and I, I, I took all the collection down, and we had the exhibition, and uh, he went on to Hull University, and I let him, well, he kept the pictures for about over a year, and then one day I went down and collected them, you know, so obviously, after the um, Michael Parkin Gallery exhibition and the um, exhibition in Richmond, um, that was it. My dad didn't do any more sort of investigation into John Doman Turner's life. And, you know, it sounds like there was some frustrations there around trying to get in contact with people by writing to every single Turner and not hearing anything. And, and so he actually, you know, he left, he left the story and that was it. So it wasn't heard of for a while. And um, so then... Um, Obviously, when uh, so in 2012, a couple of years ago, um, I wanted to get a present, a Christmas present for my dad, um, and he's very difficult to try to buy Christmas presents for. So he wanted, he always wants socks, and I thought, um, <laughs> two thousand <laughs> and, and, and I just thought, well, maybe there's something else that I can get him that he'll be interested in. And I kept thinking, what can I get him? What's he really interested in? And I just sort of kept thinking back, and I thought, God, I, re I remember him always talking about this guy called John Diamond Turner. What I did, because I wanted to buy this Christmas present for him, I went online and I typed in John Diamond Turner, and I couldn't really find any information on him, which really shocked me and surprised me, because the internet has everything on it. Um, and I came across this page, which is a Wikipedia page, um, on John Diamond Turner. <clears throat> and so actually, I... I mentioned this to my dad, and he told me that he um, actually went on there and wrote some of this. <laughs> Which really shocked me, because he's not very good with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it really made me think, this guy is obsessed, or has been obsessed, with this life story of this guy. And so, and because I'm quite curious, like he's very curious to find out more information about 
Turner, it kind of made me quite curious about it. So I started to try and do loads of um, online investigation. So now this is, you know, this is in 2012. So different from 1988 when there was no sort of internet and sort of blue you know, bloomed and the digital revolution come along. Um, but I started to look online and um, I found there was a big exhibition on, um, at the Tate Gallery, Tate Britain, um, in 2008, and it was on the Camden Town Group. But there was no pictures of John Donald Turner in it, and I just couldn't work out why. Um, and actually, this is a, um, it's quite a long quote, um, but it's a quote that was written by someone called David Buckman, who had been in contact, actually, with our research. And he wrote the West End Extra, saying that the Tate claims that this is the most comprehensive critical survey of the group's work to be shown in Britain for over 50 years. Um, this is wrong for two reasons, size and content. The Tate exhibition shows 102 pictures by nine artists, two of them, Walter Bays and Lucien Passari, um, represented by just one work. Thus, it excludes any pictures by the seven other original group members, including John Dermot Turner. So then I, um, I then came across that the, the Tate were looking, um, and they were doing an online project um, about the Camden Town group in 2012. <coughs> um, and again, no reference. They've got every other artist, but nothing on John Dermot Turner. He was a member of this group. Um, so I actually got in touch with him. Um, and I tried to find out more information and I decided to set up a website as well because I thought actually if, if um, I'm going to reach out to people I need to kind of explain why. <laughs> so um, I decided to, um, I think I wrote a press release, I've never written one in my life. Um, I looked online for different templates and I said, you know, our aim is to find out more information about John Doman Turner and please help us. Um, and so I set up the website and I started contacting lots of different people online. And this is when we were ha me and my dad started to have a conversation about um, what he knew about, you know, John Doman Turner's life. And he mentioned um, that there was a scroll, the Warburswick scroll. And I asked him, have you ever seen it? And I think he heard about this at the Michael Parkin Gallery um, at the time. And I, he said that he'd never seen this piece of work. And uh, so I said, right, we're going to go and see it. Um, and actually we came here, <laughs> we actually came, it was on stage behind this projection screen, and we came here in 2012, um, and I got in contact with the Wolverswick Local History Group through your website, um, and I just reached out and I said, oh, do you know, any, uh, do you know when the showings are going to be shown? And you told us that it comes out every, like, couple, twice, once or twice a year. Um, so we got in contact and um, someone put us in touch with Richard Scott, who's amazing, and actually that was when we found that there's, he knows loads more information about John Doman Turner. So I was like, these two have to meet. <laughs> so, um, so I got, yeah, so we managed to come down. We got in touch with Richard Scott. We came down and had a look at the scroll. And for me, it was an, a really amazing, an amazing moment because um, it's where, for me, I realised that art brings communities together. And that's exactly what your scroll is doing. It's bringing out people from their homes, coming to look at this work, and you're all there supporting your house. Um, and it's just a lovely moment um, that you don't always see in big galleries with white walls and, you know, you don't always see that. And so for me, that made me feel like this is a really important story of, you know, John Dermot is an important artist here um, and something needs to be done. He needs to be, people need to be aware of him. You know, there shouldn't be any more exhibitions where um, we have, he has, there's no reference to him. So. That really was the mission that we've been on, um, and that's what we're going to show you now, some of the findings of our research. We saw this Wolfswick scroll, there's Richard Scott. <laughs> the light is a bit dark because it was in, in there, which is very surreal um, being here tonight. Um, and this was the first time we'd seen it, and yeah, is there anyone in this photo? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and I had like a little cameras because I wanted to kind of record what we were seeing. Um, and this is the moment where Richard and my dad met, and I thought this is brilliant, this is amazing. Um, and yeah, we saw all this beautiful work, all this beautiful work. And because you've, most of you have already seen it, I'll skip through these slides. <laughs> um, but what was really interesting about this is um, we were talking to, the, to you guys and you mentioned that actually there's another scroll um, at the Swan Hotel. So that afternoon we left the Warburswick scroll and we went all the way over to Southworld 
um, which we used to go on holidays when we were younger, I think, in a caravan. Um, so I sort of remembered it, and we, um, we snuck into the back of the hotel, this one hotel, and on the walls is John Doe and Turner's scroll of the um, Trinity Fair. Now this was lovely as well, and it's really interesting. So there's four scrolls in total that John Doe and Turner did, all around the same size, um, and this all of, all of the works are um, presented in different ways. So we have one presented at a football table, um, one presented in frames in the back of a hotel room, and I'll tell you the next ones in a minute. Um, so what we found is amazing because we saw how the community started writing um, their names on the, on the works. And interestingly, only recently, through a, site, a social network called Instagram, um, we found out that a, an actress, and I can't recall her name, but I can let you know, um, she was on The Archers on Radio 4, she actually signed this when she was younger, and I think she's passed away now. Um, but we're finding all this information out, and this is full of stories, amazing stories, each of these signatures, and we want to know more, and I think there's someone in the audience who's actually yeah, featured in this role. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> Amazing, and and so you know, there's there's a huge story. You know, people's stories should be told. I think, and so we saw the Swan, uh, the Swan Hotel, oh. and the colour on this is really strong as well. Wasn't it an interesting artist? You know, you never just painted a church or a field for the all that details put in there. Yeah. At the very beginning of the scroll, uh, Simon Loftus, who I think is connected to the Admins Brewery, and I think might own the Swan Hotel, he writes a big blurb about um, John Doe and Turner. And the thing that stood out for me when I was in there was, was this, this phrase here. <laughs> so it says, um, encouraged by the response to this extraordinary work he embarked on, the Trinity Fair scroll displayed here and then completed, uh, he completed a, a final scroll. So for me, there's another scroll out there and I'm like, okay, where is it? Um, and it says, uh, the scroll was purchased for the Theatre Museum in London in the, in the 1980s. So um, immediately, we, when we went back home, we started to look up the Theatre Museum in London and my dad managed to find out that I think the V&A um, took over the uh, ownership of the, all of the collection that they had um, and they took all of the items with them and they took ownership of it, I think. Um, that's the story. And then, um, and then what was really interesting is that my dad got in touch with them and he said, have you got a scroll of this size um, with all these drawings on? And they looked. And they said no. <laughs> and so I thought, hang on, maybe they need more evidence. Maybe they need more evidence, you know. So um, I sent them a picture of this, and I sent them a picture of the scrolls, and I said, this is what we're talking about. And I got back to the same person that my dad did, and they said, actually, we think we have one. <laughs> so I was like, fantastic. When can we come and see it? <laughs> And uh, so we went down, we went down to the Blythe House, it was in the Blythe House, which I think is an archive room at the, at the v and um, and they call it the Fairground Freeze, um, and actually it's on their website, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but we went in, we got in touch with the people, and they said, yeah, come down, have a look at it. And um, there's us just as we were about to go in, um, and there it was. They actually um, put the scroll, and I think, I believe this is kind of near its most original form. Um, and this was just one view of it, so we had to have it unwrapped six times um, throughout the day um, to see the works. Now, out of the four scrolls that we've seen, this had the strongest colour, and apparently this was the first time it had been unravelled since the, um, since the 80s. Um, and when we were leaving, they, they said to us, um, this is just going to be put back in a box and never seen again. It, it, it just broke my heart that actually this is going to just be put in, kept in the archives and never be seen. Um, and this is a lovely, lovely piece of work, very similar uh, to the Trinity Fair actually. And Turner had a huge fascination with travelling circuses and, and um, theatre and musicals and you'll sort of see that um, in some of the other stuff we've got to show. Um, so these were some more examples, really bold colours. 
<laughs> and it was like magic. And do you know what? There's so much research that we need to do still around every individual thing here. So, you know, like there's there's names of people that we can look up. There's there's um, the types of circus. Uh, performers that he followed. You know, there's so much investigation that can be done with these works. It's just mind blowing. Um, and again, some more. And then, right at the end of the scroll, we saw his name. <laughs> so we could actually then confirm to the the BNA that actually this was John Doman Turner's work. And so they updated. So this was a screenshot from their website before we went. And so here it says, this is the fairground freeze um, by unknown, <laughs> unknown artist, and they didn't have anything about Turner. And then after we went, they, we managed to kind of, kind of clarify that this is a piece of Turner's work. So uh, they then updated the website with that information. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing how much our research has helped actually identify these things that may never get seen. Um, and then, of course, we knew that the South World Museum also have um, ex uh, parts of the scroll, um, and we managed to get them digitalised. There was photocopy, uh, photographs taken of the scrolls of the ferry road, and um, before it sort of got damaged, and we managed to get them digitalised. And um, this is this is the very first scroll that uh, Turner Turner did actually. So we saw them in a different order to when they were painted, but just fantastic. And this is a lot of I think of. Is it Southworld? Yeah. <laughs> and this shows us Jane. So this is where, um, what's really interesting about this is where Turner stayed when he came to Wolverswick and Southworld. So this was Jane, which was the, um, the cabin that he used to stay at in his summer residence. And we see actually in some of the letters he uses the, the address, the Southworld Harbour at the top of some of those letters. So this was, I think, a letter to um, Oliver Manson, the, um, uh, director of the Tate, um, but fantastic. And we've always wondered, you know, who is Jane? Is Jane a lady friend, or you know? But we don't think that's the case now. We just think that was the name of the cabin. Um, but we also know that he stayed at Harbour View, I believe. Um, and we'll see some work from that as well, which we'll show you. <coughs> so this is the, f uh, the very first scroll he did. And these are huge records of. Um, because I think lots of lots of the uh, drawings that we see are of things that have washed away from the floods, and then um, so it's a real historical. It's got huge historical value, and um, and a dream would be to bring these together in an exhibition, all four of them, <laughs> you know. And um, so that's yeah. So that's the ferry road as well. So another part of our investigation that we did was um, we've heard of the letters, uh, the Spencer Gore letters that he wrote. And there was, I think there was about 44 to 49 of them. So there was a lot of letters written over four years. Um, and, this, um, and one of Turner's wishes, he wrote towards the end of his life in 1936, two years before he died, um, uh, Turner wrote to the director of the Tate Gallery, Oliver Manson, and he said, um, in addition to the letters, I have always kept a number of early sketches in a portfolio by themselves, as Gore had scribbled faintly in pencil all sorts of advice and curses with regard to their technique. What shall we do about this, please? If placed under the sketches in an exhibition, they may be of great interest to some people. So for me, looking at this as a project, this was the goal, <laughs> to bring these together. And that's kind of what we want to do, we want to try and do as part of this research, really. Um, and fascinatingly, um, we found, I've been doing loads of research, so um, we've, we then come across the books that Esther Freud wrote around the Slee House, and we came across some other um, writings that I think uh, some Ian Collins had written, um, and obviously Richard Scott wrote about John Don Turner too. Um, and we found out um, this one, this was Malcolm Easton, um, who wrote about the letters, um, and he said, it would seem that Manson did not encourage Turner in his wish that these annotated drawings of it should be exhibited because they've disappeared. Well, when we got access, we managed to get access to the letters and um, because the Tate actually have copies of them in their archive, in their reading room. Um, and I managed to find that out through Twitter. I had a, uh, on a social network, I set up a John Doman Turner Twitter page and um, the, someone from the Tate actually um, copied me in a tweet. <laughs> so I got in touch with them and I just asked them, can we see the letters? And they said yes. <laughs> so, um, so we went down there, and again, my dad had never seen the letters. He'd been promised to see them by Frederick Gore, but never got to see them. Um, and actually, um, for me, 
when we read the letters, and it was a, an amazing moment, we went down there twice, and we had two eight-hour sessions, and I copied the whole lot out. So you're not allowed to take photos of them, and you're not allowed to um, photocopy them, but you are allowed to take notes and copies for research. So I copied the whole lot, because I thought, this is huge amounts of evidence for us to find other things. So um, we did that, and this was one quote that jumped out. So score says to Turner, number each drawing so that I can refer to it and ask any questions you want me to answer. I looked at the works, I looked at the artworks that we've got, and in the corner of every, like, a lot of the early sceptical works, <coughs> there's numbers on them. And those numbers tally with the letters that Spencer Gore wrote. So actually, in the corner of each letter, it says number one, through to, you know, the, 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 the largest number we found was 685, but in the letters, um, I think they mentioned 900. So it suggests that actually he's done 900 sketches over four years that he got critiqued on, which I find mind-blowing. Um, but then to actually go home and look at some of the research that we found from, um, from an early sketchbook, um, it was an amazing, it was like a moment where the jigsaw pieces all come together. <laughs> and in the letters, you see Gore write critiques about these works. So, so this is an example of the first, very first drawing um, that, that Turner sent to Spencer Gore, and it has number one in the corner, and it has the date and the place, and this is in a sketchbook that is written, he, Turner writes his name on the beginning of the sketchbook, um, and you see this picture, um, and he says in the first drawing, I think there was too much attempt to be neat and finished for the sake of neatness. Draw the contours of the trees, um, Firmly, and the first signs of appreciation of form are usually an exaggeration of it. So let yourself go. Try to show the exact line of the riverbank, um, and through all these pictures, you then start seeing other things. So, um, and in the letters, uh, Gore writes uh, number two, picture two, and then he writes a quote: "Why are the trees so dark?" And he was referring to this bit here, which is scribbled at the top, and it says there, "Why so dark?" So this is where uh, Gore used to actually write on the works as well as reply to them in the letters. Um, and we would never have known that these two exist if we didn't see those letters. So it's a really important moment for us. Um, and there's some, so many humorous moments in these letters in the work. So, for example, Gore used to encourage Turner to go to museums at night and um, draw whatever he could see. And I think Turner was quite self-conscious and he was... Um, he was very, he felt very nervous about going to the museum drawing at night. And actually, in the corner of this one, it says that he got kicked out or thrown out of the museum that night when he drew it. <laughs> it's in really tiny writing. But, um, and this is, a, I think, um, one of the exhibitions that he sort of drew at the time. And this, this is Gore here where he says, go, go do three or four drawings in an hour. Um, you could do this quite well at nights in South Kensington Museum and the light wouldn't matter particularly. Uh, really lovely. And then we also see some of the later sketches. So these then sort of tally with the time that he went and joined the Camden Town Group. So it's very well known that Spencer Gore and Walter Sicker used to attend music halls. They had a love for music and theatre. And they used to go into music theatre halls and they used to draw what they could see. Um, and they did draw a lot of the audience. And, um, and we see here that Turner's done exactly the same. So he's gone in and um, he's drawn, he's all, even drawn the front of the, um, the theatre. And uh, this theatre doesn't exist anymore. But I managed to track down like an early brochure of it. I bought it on eBay actually. Um, and this guy had a load of old um, brochures or programmes um, of it. And this was the only picture I could find of the Surrey Theatre that was there, but not anymore. Um, and then here's some more. So here's some more sketches um, from, from the Spencer Gore sort of and John Doman Turner period. And he says, a uh, huge quote here around drawing things too dark and making things light. Um, so really, really fascinating. And these are the works that Gore and Sickert did. So you can kind of see that they're very sort of paired. Um, and also in the letters, so it has been mentioned, I think, by Richard Scott and that they've both thought that um, John Doman Turner was tutored by Walter Sickert. And in the letters, Gore tells uh, Turner to go and attend Sickert's uh, evening classes. So he says, and this tallies up with the time that Sickert actually did the, um, ran the lessons. Um, so Sickert here is, he says, he's, Sickert is teaching two nights a week at Westminster School of Art. I advise you to go if you can manage it. I think he begins on the 21st of September. And actually this is a picture of Walter Sickert and Spencer Gore um, of the time, of that time. Um, and so these are some of the drawing sketches that appear to be uh, from the Sickert life drawing classes. That they had, and um, these are of. We
we believe, of the Costa girls that he was so fascinated by at the time. Um, and in um, some of the letters, he sort of talks about his fascination with Sally Waters, who was, who was a, a Costa girl at, the t at that period. And interestingly, this one's in the sketchbook. And now, when we look at his later works, Turner's later works, we find that he cannot draw faces. <laughs> um, but actually, what's really interesting here is that when he focuses and spends time in a lesson, he can draw faces very, very well. Um, and then there's this work. So in our research, we found that there's this uh, a piece of work, a drawing, um, with amongst Sigurd's collection that is by an artist, an unknown artist. <laughs> And then Wendy Barron actually went on to write that it must be someone connected to Sig or someone that was in his class, and she believed it could be a Doma Turner. Now, looking at the sketchbooks that we found, we do feel, you know, when we look at these pictures, we think it's very likely that this probably is, a, is his work. And another thing that we're looking at at the moment, which is part of our research, is that um, there's a catalogue of Sigurds um, from an exhibition that he did at the Carfax Gallery. Um, and it wasn't part of the Camden Town Group, it was Sigurds' own exhibition. And inside, there's loads of annotations and scribbles and drawings um, of someone who's drawn every single painting in the exhibition. And um, at the end, you can kind of see very Turner-like um, comments. <laughs> so people write, and sometimes write on his work. Um, we, we want to see these, actually. We've not actually seen these uh, face to face, but we feel that this could be Turner's work here. So this is kind of, you know, like what we're doing is trying to dig deeper and find out more and more information about Turner. And, um, you know, his association with Sicker, actually, which is really strong. And I think in the biography of Turner's, there's a lot of talk about Gore, but, you know, there is a references now we found to Sicker. So that leads me on to spreading the word. So, um, so obviously we want to tell this story and we want people to know about him and we want people to come forward and tell us stories about him. Um, and that's one, one of our missions. So we, I got in touch with Tom Porter who works for the East Anglian Daily Times um, and he um, interviewed us and published a story on us um, on the work that we're doing and some of the research we've found. Um, and what we did, we put this out and we didn't know if we'd get anything from it, any response. Um, and a few months passed and we've been doing research and we're trying to write a book about this. Um, and it's a struggle because we've never done one before. <laughs> um, and what we found, um, so a lady got in touch with us and she said we've got some early works of others from Warperswick from 1922 to 1923. Um, and she actually sent them to us and she said, I really hope this helps with your research. Um, and so this is what we want to show you tonight, and I don't think this has been seen. Some of them are like very basic sketches, um, and some of the quality of the images aren't as good as what you've seen just now. But this one is, do you want to talk about this one, Dad? So this one's from the ground floor window of Harbour View um, in Warberswick. And, um, and what's really interesting here is this little comment that he writes in the corner. And it says, the artist can see a picture where we cannot. So here's the vicarage in Warberswick. So this is a sketch. And then St Andrew's Church. So this is from the 17th of September 22. And actually these vary in size. So you get really, in the sketchbooks, you get really small ones and really large ones. Um, and this is quite a small one, actually. Um, and we were parked up there just before we came here tonight. And then we were just sort of running through our notes. And I just found it really bizarre that we were sort of sitting somewhere where Turner spent so much time and drawing the church we were sort of sat under. And it's amazing, really. And then this is um, Anchor, Anchor, yeah. what is it, Anchor Lane? Do you want to talk about this one? Yeah. <laughs> this is a little treat for us, I think. Because uh, that's her uh, house here, I believe. Yes, that, that was when it was the pub. Yeah. And um, Turner, Turner, Turner comes back. Turner comes back a year later, and it's gone. <laughs> he, he puts down there underneath the drawing, which he'd done a year previously. Oh God, the house is gone. You know, <laughs> Esther's nicked it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, oh, this so bad. I can't make out what that black. <coughs> I can't make out what, whether it's black shadow or um, whether it's tarmac. Sometimes they used to, sometimes they used to tarmac, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. You know, put a picture on or something to stop the dent going through. So it's a lovely picture there. That's a great picture. 
isn't it? it pretty, pretty, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's not done so steadily as a, as an illustrator might do, but it's just a, a lovely, fresh drawing. And the thing I like about, the thing I like about John Damon Turner's work, is what he left out. What he doesn't, you know, if he'd have put more paint in, if he'd have painted the sky blue, and painted every, covered up all the white. I think he's lost a lot of the charm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what makes his work so charming. Is the uh, the fact that he doesn't cover it in paint, you know. You know, I would be I, w I wouldn't leave I wouldn't leave paper like that, would you, if I was painting, would you? I don't suppose Richard would, would you? You'd paint a lot, wouldn't you, Richard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is um I think this is um Southwold. On the green, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely, charming, charming picture. The little tea room, you know. How life used to be so beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 These are the the, the, the lady who sent us the sketchbooks have kept some of these because they're so beautiful. And she's framed them and obviously keeping them, you know. Don't blame them. This is Wave Crest. There's a few examples of Turner's work from Wave Crest. Um, and actually, this is, he writes down here that this is Wave Crest, but from a different angle. I think you've got a beautiful uh, version of that, which we saw at the exhibition um, anniversary event. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I haven't got the, uh, the right touch either. Yeah. Uh, I did their write ups for every picture. There was a write up, oh, I think, Steve. Yeah. 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 So, you know, they give me some cards and money. Before I drive a ride, that's lovely, isn't These places still stand, aren't they? Yes. We went down to the car park, you know. Oh, last time we came. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is on the beach. Uh, <laughs> look at the children on the beach, you know, you know the little hats and things, you know, it's beautiful. That's a beautiful drawing. That's a beautiful drawing. I'd sooner have that than a Rembrandt, honestly. I would. <laughs> well, yeah, it's so charming, isn't it? You know. So where next? So uh, for us, you know, there's things that we want answers to. So we want to see what it looks like. <laughs> um, we have no idea. Uh, we've got we've got some sort of leads around uh, some caricature caricatures that we've seen and um, that we're, we're trying to find out more about. And um, we didn't have time to kind of put that in this presentation because there was so much to talk about anyway. Um, but yeah, what does he look like? You know, there's loads of unanswered questions. You know, who features? Who are these people that feature on all these scrolls? You know, can we find out more about them? Um, lots more stuff really um, and uh, obviously what we're trying to do now is we're trying to you know it was interesting when I was looking back through my father's documents that he was kind of writing to sort of mark and parking gallery to get that exhibition set up um, I saw that he said there that he was going to write a book and he never did <laughs> so for me I want to try and help that now I'm no I'm not an author I've never written any I'm not very good at writing but I'm finding <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that um, I'm good at research, I'm finding. So I'm good at that, whereas my dad's very good at spotting things with artwork. And then, and together, we're, I'm trying to encourage him to write more, um, which is quite a challenge. <laughs> um, but we're trying to write, but we've, we've written quite a lot. We're trying to critique all the works that we've found. Um, and we do, we want to make John Damon Turner recognised for all of this work. You know, he's done amazing things here. We want him to be recognised for what he, you know, what he truly loved. Um, and uh, what was the other stuff? An exhibition, an exhibition bringing a retrospective of his whole life, you know, bringing the letters and the, uh, the letters and the original sketchbooks together, bringing all the scrolls together, bringing all the early works together, it would be amazing. Um, and what you'll hear in a minute, you'll hear Esther talk about the sea house. And when I was reading that, I was reading that because I work on this as a side sort of, I do this after, I do all my research after I finish work. 
and, and I'm completely obsessed with it now. And I never thought I would be into art history, but I really appreciate it now because um, you just find out it's the stories behind the works. And I must admit, when I first saw Turner's work, I didn't like it. <laughs> um, but it's the stories behind the works that, for me, are the most amazing findings, really. And that's what makes me appreciate art history, which I never thought I would say. Um, and so, yeah, so... Um, and when I read The Sea House, actually, it really turned Turner into life, into a human being, um, which I found amazing. And I kept sending extracts to my dad. <laughs> on, uh, I kept taking it, pictures on my tablet of it, actually, and I emailed him, saying, look at this. Um, and so, yeah, and, and we haven't done this on our own. This isn't a solely only only project you know we wouldn't have been able to do this without the Walperswick local history group um, and with um, we'd like to do some shout outs with Richard Scott and um, for all the work that he's helped you know like to show us um, and uh, Philip Keck and um, John English as well for actually bringing us here today um, and if there's anyone in the audience that knows anything about Turner or is interested in Turner get in touch with us we've got a website um, it's called johndomanturner.com <laughs> and uh, yeah and follow our journey because we're going to keep we've not done loads with the website at the moment because we're trying to bring together all our research but once we get to that point we want to then start reaching out to publishers if anyone knows any publishers let us know <laughs> um, yeah and it's all a journey for us because we're you know not done it before um, but yeah we've got loads of research and we want to share it basically so, um, so yeah, that's it. Um, I believe we're going to answer some questions. Um, Has anybody got any questions while it's all red hot in your minds? No? Perhaps we can take them at the end after us. Yeah. Okay. Esther's going to come and give us a little chat. Only about ten minutes or so. She hopes. <laughs> come and have this microphone. Thanks so much. Um, I was asked to um, come and talk a little bit to you about my understanding and sort of interest in John Donham Turner. Um, I thought because maybe maybe um, these guys didn't have enough and they needed me to fill in a bit. It turned out that it's totally unnecessary, and it was so fascinating. And I kind of wish that I'd been to this talk before I wrote my book, because it would have been so useful and so um, illuminating just to know what you've uncovered. Um, I had decided, it's sort of, it's quite, really, I think this book, it was around 2000, it feels like a long time ago, um, I wanted to write a book set in, in this village. And I already had various things that I wanted to put into it. And one of them was um, a collection of letters um, throughout the marriage of my grandparents. From him to her, she had kept all his letters. I don't know what uh, he had done with hers. But um, a lot of it, a lot of the letters were to Walderswick. And they were incredibly romantic and, and really uh, fascinating over this period of their marriage, this long marriage that they had. Um, my grandparents came to this village in the late 30s. They'd come from Germany. Um, when Hitler came to power, they decided they must leave. Um, and they were looking for a sort of idyllic place to spend their holidays as they had had somewhere similar in Germany in the East Coast in the Baltic. So they found Walberswick and um, I think I probably used this in the book but uh, my, my, um, my grandfather wrote to my grandmother um, the sea is almost as cold as hidden sea and there are even more mosquitoes. So you know, it's perfect for us, we feel just at home. And in the research of the book I went to hidden sea, this little island where they'd had a house and it was so strangely familiar. Just really, really felt so at home there. Um, so I already had this idea in my head to set, a, to set um, a book here and I had begun it and I then heard about the scroll. And it seems strange because it became such an important part of my book that I would have begun the book without knowing about the scroll. But I heard about it and then very much like you, I heard that Richard was showing it here and I remember it so clearly as a Saturday morning and um, coming down and standing as the football table was slowly sort of un the, the scroll was slowly unfolded for five or six of us and I was my imagination was just totally galvanized I just I just felt that this was the missing link and that this was going to make my book so the book that I needed it to be um, I then tried to find out some things about John Doman Turner. You will sympathise. I couldn't find out anything. All I knew were his dates, that he was a clerk, 
that he'd lived in Streatham. Um, he'd had a correspondence with Spencer Gore. That was it. So I decided, because my book was very much about displacement and about um, people trying to find a place to belong, um, I thought, well, I will make my artist, the, the artist of the scroll, someone that I can feel um, connected with. And I had a real yearning to find a place to belong. When I first started coming here, I felt, as I'm sure so many people who've lived here or come here later, it's like, this is a place that I like to be. This is a place that's so special, that makes you want to come back. And I imagined that if I had been a painter, I would have wanted to paint every single house in this village, as I quite often just stared at houses. I always go, if someone ever invites me into the house, I'm so happy. I think, another house that I've been inside. Um, it was actually a few weeks ago, I was standing in the village shop, staring at the vegetables. Someone said, would you like to see my house? And I went, always. <laughs> someone was trying to sell their house and wanted... Anyway, it was made me laugh. Was, uh, how did they know? Um, so um, I decided to turn my, my artist into a, a German Jewish refugee. And I kept one thing that um, John Doman Turner had, which was that this extraordinary correspondence. I was lucky enough to go. Um, my father knew Freddie Gore. I told him about what I discovered, and he said, "Oh, yes, I'll, 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 I'll ask Freddie Gore if you can. Um, this is Spencer's son, Spencer Gore's son. If you can go, if he knows anything about these letters, yes, come round for tea." So I went round to the house in, in um, Chelsea where he lived, and he was pretty elderly by then, and very much like your experience of the Tate archives. I couldn't um, take them away and photocopy them, so I went every day for days on end and read them and wrote down anything that seemed useful for me. And um, they were really interesting. I got such a picture of this man. He was very tentative, shy, and, and it was so amazing then to see the paintings and how he developed as an artist, <coughs> because at the beginning um, he sends pictures clearly. Obviously I hadn't seen them. The terse response from Spencer Gore, no, why? You know, as we saw, why so dark? Just, but then as he becomes more enamored of his pictures, the, 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 the letters and responses become much fuller, and he starts to be very charmed. And then quite near the end of the correspondence, and there are many letters, there's a really touching moment where he says, I've entered um, three or four paintings for an exhibition. It's quite prestigious, um, I hope you're pleased. And he said, oh yes, I'm very pleased for you. And he says, no. Um, for you, they're your paintings. And John Doman Turner goes, oh, no, no, no. I don't want my paintings exhibited. I, I, no. He didn't really want to stop being a clerk, it seemed to me. He wanted to carry on um, doing his hobby, his passion, and being anonymous, and just enjoying <coughs> painting the things that he really, really loved. He didn't want, it seemed to me from this correspondence, to be part of the art world, to be involved in this life. I also took the fact that um, he was deaf and gave that to my character. I just thought I'd just read a couple of very short sequences where you can see how I turned John Dover Turner into my man, who's called Max. Um, I'll try and read with this um, in my hand. So this is um, a moment where he's just where he's talking about, um, as someone said earlier, how I have changed the name. So Spencer Gore is someone called Cuthbert Henry. <laughs> I always think changing the name, and no one will ever know anything, but it turns out it's not as easy as that. Um, he had 37 prized and valuable letters written to him by the artist Cuthbert Henry. He'd had to pay for them, that was true, but over the years of their correspondence, a friendship had developed that went further than the fee. It had been an idea of his father, after an, visiting an exhibition of Henry in 1927, that instead of formal art training, Max could send his pictures to London, and in return for payment, Henry would give his valuable instruction on how each one could be improved. Max dutifully sent off three drawings, pen and ink sketches, views mostly from the windows of his house, and with them went his list of questions. Interminable, he realised now. He'd poured out all his misgivings, his terrors, his absurdly optimistic fears, and waited with unparalleled expectations for the reply. Quite good, and once infuriated. How am I meant to comment on something that is impossible to see? <laughs> so the kind of things that came back. Um, just another very short <coughs> section. So, my character Max arrives in this village, which 
was called um, Stirber, I think, um, in order to actually, he's sort of commissioned as a favour by somebody um, to paint a picture of her, but he can't bear to paint the picture of this woman, and he starts um, distracting himself by painting houses. And she asks him, were you thinking of using watercolour? Gertrude was lying in a deck chair, um, reading a pamphlet on the phobias of the very young. Max imagined she was longing to analyse him, make a diagnosis on why he was unable to begin. No, he said, oils. The whole scene was already a watercolour, with no need for him to paint it in. He wondered if this easternmost coast of England could be painted in oils, and if it was attempted, would it be possible to retain the huge translucence of the sky? Even on a cloudy day, the dome was so immense that somewhere a beam of sun could usually escape the clouds and mark a strip of light across the ground. It turned the grass unearthly green, the puddles alpine blue, and it made Max think of the studies he had made of Italian church ceilings, the fat cherubs, the fingers of God sparking through. Um, I could talk endlessly, but it's been such a long evening and so much has been said. I, I'm going to leave it there, but thank you so much. Right. That was a different tale from the end, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, coffee will be served in a couple of minutes. And thank you very much for coming. To Esther, <laughs> a little bottle for you. Thank you very much. So that was a very good evening, masterminded by John. He uh, has worked quite hard. Um, Richard's at the back with his new projector, showing us all the, all the pictures. Thank you very much. And the Mrs. Robinson's family, thank you very much for coming up from London. Yeah, yeah. yeah.